citizen. Oh, oh, oh. Out of many we are. We are world citizens. Same vision is for equal rights and justice for the people. Them, what's happening to this beautiful world that we're living in? World citizen, lift up your voices. Welcome to the People Powered Planet Podcast. Each week we have exciting guests talking not about all the incredible problems of the world, the cascading ocean of darkness of, of huge problems, but rather the solutions. We have some of the top solutionaries who are working on how we can inspire our world to a new vision and a better way to bring us together as a planet, as one world. He flew over some of the most dangerous and scary, frightening terrains, things that his little plane was not ready to be able to do, and he pushed it to the limit with incredible ways of boosting the plane. And he has written books about it, and he, every place he touches down, he talks to people about world citizenship, and he's had some amazing adventures. Let's go ahead and start off with this little short clip about his adventure. So, you know, it's at this moment, 24 hours out, that I start to question you know, why am I doing this? Is it ego? Is it truly something for the planet? Is it just the wildest adventure I could, that a, an adrenaline junkie could dream up? There's probably some truth to all that. And it's funny because it, it would not be easy to, to back out now, not after two years and so many promises and, you know, so much uh, support that's been accepted. I don't know, I just, I feel like I'm just about to take the biggest chance of my life. It is certainly, the riskiest flight I've ever made with more opportunities for failure than I've ever experienced. Seven weeks ago, I started in San Diego, California, en route to the South Pole and the North Pole for a five-month global aviation expedition. Along the way, I'm exploring many nations and discovering more about what it truly means to be a citizen of the world. They call me Zen Pilot. I guess what that means is while I seek out adventure from 37,000 feet up, I also seek a balance to share what I've learned as an aviator and to learn from others across the planet their lessons and wisdom of a life well lived. I'm seeing the similarities, not the differences among the people I'm meeting. My inspiration has been the support that other people have given me, their belief in me, my mission, and my team. This allows me to take myself and the plane to its absolute and total limits. I ask myself, is failure even possible with this much love and support behind me? I'm conducting newly created experiments in collaboration with NASA and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. I'm testing for atmospheric plastic pollutions and utilizing only biofuels at the poles. Finally made it to Patagonia and probably about a quarter of the way through the trip uh, with the longest, hardest uh, leg ahead of me to the South Pole. I don't know, it's like that leap of faith that you make. For anybody who's ever jumped out of a plane, you know, parachuting, you have that last instant where you go, do I stay or do I go? And uh, this is just one of those moments where I, I feel like, you know, I've lived a good life and if it ends here, then I, I was doing something that I was passionate about, that had a great impact on the planet. And even in failure, there's success because you've tried. And I don't think the, the successes I've had in my life that have gotten me to this moment in time were all so that I would just fail. Yeah, I, I know I'm going through with it. We'll see how it turns out. But, you know, I, I'm in that moment of fear where where I'm questioning everything, but I know at some point if I go deep enough into that feeling, then it goes away. It's like if you're not afraid, your dream wasn't big enough. And if you're not afraid, then you probably haven't prepared enough because of the risk that's ahead. And situations like this, people respond in one of two ways. They either freeze or they just move ahead. And I think I've had my moment of panic and self-doubt, fear, and now it's just time to get this done. Golf Alpha, turn right heading 100 degrees. Right 100, 200 Golf Alpha. And request your current heading. Uh, current heading is uh, 180 true, the South Pole.
welcome Robert DeLorenis. Uh, please start by telling us a little bit about what happened on Monday. Monday, Arthur, was Citizen of the World Day as proclaimed by uh, the mayor of San Diego. And simultaneously, of course, it was World Peace Day uh, per the United Nations. So we were really very, very excited to have, you know, those matching dates. Um, our mission was always one of global peace, you know, connecting the South Pole to the North Pole and everybody in between. And it came at a time when the world was truly polarized. And when I reflect back on the three delays for departure, it makes sense to me now that, you know, this, this mission needed to happen at the height of the global pandemic. And of course, I was in Spain in the epicenter for Europe when the uh, pandemic hit. I was actually living in a monastery, a thousand-year-old monastery in Montserrat with a bunch of monks um, on the day they shut the country down. And I ended up staying, not at the monastery, but in Spain for two months. And it was really funny because that South Pole leg, which was certainly the hardest of the trip, came very early, you know, in the nine-month polar circumnavigation that was supposed to take four to five months. And in my book and in the 10-part docuseries, I talk about how that leg broke me, you know, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And what I came to realize is that it broke me open for what was to come. And what was to come was, you know, this global pandemic that we could not plan for in any way, really. I mean, who would have ever expected it? But in the end, I ended up in a place that was described as a Zen villa. And for the two months that I was there, it was a time of reflection and meditation. And in one of the many interviews that we did, uh, this one that I'm referring to happened in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we were talking to a paraglider pilot and he talked about before you can find peace in the world, you need to find it in yourself. And it was kind of an interesting dilemma for the, myself and the film crew because we were going looking for peace in the world and I realized, oh my God, I need to find it in myself first, which is a very you know, tall order. But I had that two months of isolation to really you know, dig in uh, as deeply as I could, reflect, meditate, you know, sort of stay in the silence. And I really felt like I achieved some manner of uh, personal inner peace during that time. And then of course the mission continued and it was, um, you know, chock full of challenges from start to finish. And they were rolling in sometimes, you know, two or three a day, which seemed overwhelming. What were the most scary of these uh, challenges? Well, there were a lot. I could talk for a while on that. Um, the ones that scared me the worst were uh, the bursting fuel tanks inside the plane. There was a total of uh, three uh, major fuel leaks, which totaled about 150 gallons of Jet A inside the plane. And if you've ever smelled jet fuel, it's you know very toxic. And on every single flight of that um, trip, I had uh, I could taste it in my throat. I could feel it burning my eyes a little bit and my sinuses, but you know, we persisted. And just like the COVID virus was not gonna stop us, uh, these fuel leaks were not gonna stop us as well. Wow, well, you know, um, I mean, I think maybe that what you're talking about is really a kind of a parallel for our times. We're at times that are breaking us and maybe out of that breaking of us comes something emerging new and more powerful. So if I understand it, you're saying that uh, you didn't expect to spend this, these months in a monastery, but because of the, you touched down the time of coronavirus, you were forced into this kind of retreat that ended up being, uh, by surprise, a crucial part of your transformation and your mission. Is that right? You know, I, I think you're absolutely right. It was, you know, when we were getting delayed for departure, I was always used to making my deadlines. And as these three delays happened, uh, I was upset, you know, I wanted to come through for my 95 plus sponsors, but I think um, it wasn't the right time for the planet. And, you know, during that time we became more prepared, we were humbled. The uh, first circumnavigation along the equator in 2015, I prepared for about six months. For this one, because it was so much more difficult and more complicated, it took 18. And that doesn't even include, you know, the three years it took to get the plane ready. So, um, yeah, I, I think this, you know, trip was meant to connect a polarized world. That is incredible. Well, so now tell me a little more about uh, some of the people you met along the way. Uh, what did you find? What was the reception? I mean, here they are in the middle of, you know, in, in the least expected place, a plane touches down saying citizen of the world, and you come out talking to people. 
what's what's their reaction to this this oddity appearing in their midst? <laughs> well, I think the plane, the citizen of the world, is a very very impressive plane. Um, it's um, it's got so much power and capability. You know, it's capable of seven continents. We flew it to six, um, and I'm still in awe. You know, when I look at that plane, but. You know, the, the purpose of the film and the mission and the book is to show that there are more similarities and differences amongst people. And the way we came up with to show the world that, not just to talk about it, but to show them, was to go around the world and interview as many different types of people as we could. And that included probably about 50 people by the time we were done. Some of the sort of more extreme ones were a Zulu ranger from South Africa, uh, we talked about the paraglider from Brazil, but there was a dog sled musher from Argentina, uh, Eric Lindbergh in Seattle, the grandson of Charles Lindbergh. There were uh, Iron Woman athletes and amazing artists, you know, dancers and musicians. And we thought if we could show people that everybody pretty much values the same thing. So we'd say, well, what does it mean to be a citizen of the world? And they'd say, well, you know, uh, we're all connected. And then they would explain the things they valued, which were always, always family, love, peace, compassion, safety, security, health. It didn't matter what the color of their skin was, what their ethnicity, you know, their religion, uh, their socioeconomic class, where they lived, how they lived. They all valued the same things, which brings us to the conclusion that we're all connected as humans. And when things get difficult in a plane, you go back to your fundamentals, aviate, navigate, communicate. And when things get difficult on the planet, like we're experiencing now, we go back to the fundamentals of being a human and the things that we value. What that says to me, I mean, here we have a world full of people who are all feeling and wanting the same thing. And they're on different opposite sides of political divides. They're Palestinians and Israelis, they're, they're uh, you know, red states, blue states, uh, they're uh, green and, you know, filled, uh, all these kind of uh, seemingly opposites, and yet they all want the same thing. Is there some dysfunction, some, something happening that's a, that, that we need to shift in the way we've organized our world that can allow that great beauty of human beings to interact? Is there something blocking us from interacting in the way that uh, we, we, we truly have within us to, 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 uh, to connect. Well, I'm going to say something that might surprise you, but I think the trend as humans is to complicate your lives. And when I was talking to a guy named Father Tony at the monastery in Montserrat, he said, look, monks have very simple lives. You know, we don't uh, do complicated things here that stress us out. We live in the moment and we're of service, but the ambition is not something that we focus on. And that was kind of, you know, mind blowing to me because since I was a child, I was always raised to compete and uh, work hard and, you know, do these different things. But when you end up in a place like Sweden, like I did for about six weeks, um, you know, they're encouraged not to compete until they're about 12. And the emphasis is on cooperation. So, you know, when you start to put all this together, you go, wow, you know, maybe, maybe the, the path I've taken is taking me in the wrong direction. Maybe I need to focus on connecting with other human beings, you know, oneness, cooperation. And um, I don't know, I experienced some of that on my trip and I think there's some truth to it. Well, it, that, that I think that's really something key. And I know uh, uh, you also connected with the, with the philosophy and connection of, uh, of, of Gary Davis. Um, how did his story uh, touch you or interact with you and your, your mission? Uh, with his mission as being world citizen number one. Well, it's interesting you say that because I think our missions are coming more and more into alignment. You know, obviously he was um, making his mark on the world uh, after World War II and people were fed up with the division um, between different types of people and they wanted a different way. You know, they wanted to see the world as one. Um, you guys call it world citizen. We call it citizen of the world pretty much the same in a lot of ways. Um, but, you know, it's got to come at a time when the world needs it and recognizes it. But it's also another, it's a repeat of the same lesson. And maybe we didn't learn it when Gary was talking about it and we needed to see it again. And maybe again, who knows? But um, certainly the lesson is clear. We just have to receive it and be open to it. Hmm. 
Um, so uh, tell me a little bit more about uh, what your experience was about the, the structural uh, dividing lines separating us. I mean, across the planet, we have all these different labels and, and borders, guards, guards keeping us from connecting with each other. Um, how does that, how do you see the people that all are wanting the same thing, being able to somehow interconnect and have uh, a, a power to overcome those dividing lines that are increasingly in our world uh, causing divisiveness and separation. How, how, do, how do we emerge from that to see in that very separation and division that's happening, those people in pain wanting to interconnect, but just needing somehow a, a new tool or breakthrough to allow them to really get what they actually want and don't know they want? Well, you know, what I hear you saying, Arthur, is, you know, there are these borders and boundaries between countries, but when you look at those, they're all man-made. I mean, a plane, which is the ultimate metaphor for this message, uh, doesn't know those boundaries. You know, once it's in the air, it's flying, it's moving across the planet unobstructed. And I think that ultimately that's the natural condition that humans want. They want to connect, you know, in, in the isolation that we've had through COVID, we find that, you know, we really need as humans to connect with other people. We need to see them. You know, we need to touch them. We need to hang out with them. And, you know, when you have your mask on and you're covering up like, the, your face, you know, we need to experience people smiling and being sad and um, being surprised. That's part of what it means to be human. So to keep us apart, I think, is, is not in the natural order of things. And Gary was uh, very good at that, right? He left one country and was stuck uh, on the border between another one, he was trying to break down those those boundaries. So um, I think his message is is still pertinent today, and we're still, like I said, trying to learn that lesson firsthand. Well, it's it's kind of interesting that uh, that right in the middle of the separation, there's an amazing connection happening. I mean, you mentioned that here you were locked down, separated from your flight, connecting people around the world. And in that separation, you had to go to this monastery and get that inner, inner strength and wisdom that actually helped you connect. Now in the world, on the one hand, we're seeing people separated, divided. You can't even go out and to a restaurant with friends and other things, you've got to wear a mask. And on the other hand, we're seeing all, all over the world, people learning how to do Zoom conference interactions where they're suddenly reaching a far wider circle. They're not just reaching people in their geographical neighborhood, they're interconnecting with people on opposite sides of the world and they're having language translators helping them connect. Is there somehow, just as you found, some hidden gem in the separation that left you in that monastery, a, a, a gem that can be the kernel of a new world arising for the people of the world to come together in, in amazing new ways using using the technology, but also using it in such a way that we could begin to become more human. Well, you know, I have this theory and it's uh, that little kids are a major connecting point between adults that are having differences. And um, I've seen it happen over and over again. You know, when you meet somebody and there's they have children um, extending some kindness to the kids um, is, a, is a way to connect people. We released a book called The Little Plane That Could uh, during the trip, not because we had the time to put this thing together because it was a very challenging time, but because we felt like it was important enough that it had to be done no matter what. And in fact, if the trip ended for me in some tragic way, the De Laurentiis Foundation had very clear uh, instructions and funding to finish that book, uh, the next book that I'm working on now in the docu series. So this book uh, is directed at kids three to five years of age to get them or nurture the excitement they have for aviation, which I think is a common thread uh, that connects all people. And it's not the only one. When we were doing these interviews, we found that you know music connects other people. Um, athletics connects other people. There's a lot of these threads, but um, it needs to happen. And I, I know when a parent um, sees somebody, like I said, extending kindness to their child, that opens their heart. And we all, you know, love kids and we all were kids. It's part of our history. 
So I think that's a very important part. I mean, there are others on the trip, but that I think is just the most direct way possible. Well, you have made such an incredibly valuable point that music uh, can connect the world. We saw when We Are the World song really had the majority of the world's population part of singing and, and experiencing that We Are the World. Uh, and I know we have people on this call who are advocating a new uh, we are the world being produced. And then you mentioned athletics. I'm the Olympics, the one time in the world where wars actually stop for interactive athletic games and, 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 and over part the, the, most of the world's population, the majority actually got to see, have gotten to see and be a part of the Olympics. What a way to connect the world. And then children. I mean, all across the internet, we're seeing our children and pets interconnecting and we love them. It doesn't matter what part of the world or where around the world. And I think you're so right that these are some of the key connectors that can bring us together and, and, and get us out of that and, and get us to rise above that broken nation state system. So it becomes Maybe, do you think it's possible that that nation state system that seems so broken could become less and less relevant, relevant as we the people rise to our own interconnected place on a planetary basis? Well, you know, part of the reason, Arthur, uh, we did this mission is we were tired of waiting for other people to take care of world problems for us. And certainly, you know, you can send an email, you can talk to somebody, but there's nothing more powerful than going out into the world, sitting across from somebody, you know, shaking their hand when it was allowed and having a physical connection with them. So, you know, our mission is to be the example. Certainly, we can't force anybody to change the way they see things, but if they can meet us, they can interact with us, they can see that, you know, we just, we want the best. And um, I don't know, we'll see what happens. You know, I'm definitely, uh, I have a, such an amazing team of people that have supported this flight. Um, we're doing the very best we can. And I would encourage everybody just to do something. You know, world working together is gonna to be our solution through the problem. And, you know, issues, I mean, we talked about pets and um, kids and music and all and athletics being something that can bring the world together, but our global issues also bring us together because no one person, company, or country can solve it alone. Wow, well now I know that uh, uh, we have a lot of questions coming up in our chat box and uh, I wanna talk with you more and I have more questions for you too, uh, but let me take a few minutes to turn this over to uh, Melanie Bennett, who is both uh, a, a co-producer, a producer on the movie, The World Is My Country, that really gives rise to these podcasts and that's just so aligned with your mission. And she's the, uh, the, the, the co-producer of these People Powered Planet podcast. Uh, Melanie, do you want to talk about a few of the, or, or invite a few of our uh, uh, listeners to join in the question? And by the way, we have listeners live on the Zoom, but we also have so many more listeners live on YouTube. Uh, they may not, they're not in a position to be able to ask these live questions, but if they come to our club, theworldismycountry.com slash club and sign in, the next time they'll be able to be part of the Zoom meeting and ask questions as well. But we welcome our, our YouTube guests as well. Uh, so Melanie, why don't you take it forward a few moments here? Robert, Robert, thank you so much. Um, I just wanna say about fl your flight, your epic flight, um, how courageous, I mean, yes, of course you were afraid at points, but uh, I just want to recognize your, how courageous you are as a person and dedicated to doing something, you know, making something happen, not just waiting for it to happen and doing something. And I love what you said about we can all do something and we all should do something. It's all up to all of us. And um, I think that's what people need to realize and, and not be so worried, just get out and do something and that will help the most. Melanie, before you move on, that that courage that you're recognizing, thank you for that. That doesn't mean I wasn't afraid. I mean, there were times when I was absolutely terrified, but it means you just do it anyway because your mission is so important. Yeah, and I think that's, yeah. that's what courage, being courageous is. I mean, even if you're afraid, I mean, that's the most courageous people. You're still, you're super afraid and you still do it. And so that's you. And uh, uh, thank you for doing that. I'd like to say that that's faith over fear. And um, when I did my South Pole leg, I packed up all my personal belongings in my hotel room, put my uh, family's address on there. So if I didn't make it back, I could send those things to them. And I had assessed my chances of survival. I don't mean 
like coming back and landing, not making the South Pole. I mean, like being alive in 18 hours is about 50%. Wow. So, um, you know, the things that are important to us as humans and the planet, I think are worth taking a risk for. And, you know, it was a mitigated risk, but it's still a risk. Wow, that just might, my, my, yeah, just, uh, I'm glad I wasn't there with you at that exact moment because I, I would just be, so I'm, anyway, I'm, I was happy, I was so happy when I heard you got back and, and um, yes, yeah, so um, we have Jean Stevens, but she does have Zoom, a little Zoom issue, unless, Jean, do you want to try? I think she does, but I can read her question. It's right here. Uh, her first question is, are you related to Dino De Laurentiis? You know, I, um, I don't believe I'm directly related to him. His name is spelled a little bit differently than mine. It's uh, I-I-S at the end as compared to I-S. Uh, certainly I've seen some of his films and it's kind of cool to, you know, see that close connection or hope for that connection. But uh, I think we're operating independently. Okay. And then she also wanted to say, Congratulations for such an incredible peace science adventure. And wants to know if you can give an update on any scientific findings via your flights research and Scripps Institute and NASA. Well, you know, we're actually waiting um, for that information still. Uh, the scientists are, of course, very detailed and precise. So they're uh, moving at their natural pace. One of the things that you may not know is for that Scripps Institute of Oceanography experiment where we tested for microfibers in the atmosphere all the way around the planet. Now, given they found them on the earth, even at the South Pole and you know, the most remote places and in the water, nobody's tested for it in the air. And when I was in Spain, uh, we talked to the scientist and he was convinced that on those um, collection pads, we could also test the plastics for COVID virus. So it was critical that I leave at the height of the pandemic to test for COVID on the plastics in the atmosphere. So that's the, the one piece that we're really waiting to hear back on. But uh, I've been told from um, the scientists at UC Santa Barbara, which um, actually did the funded NASA experiment that uh, they're downloading the data for from the SD card on that uh, uh, wafer scale spaceship. So, uh, no, I don't have a direct answer for you on those, but uh, they're moving along. So, uh, we all have, have a question from Claire. Claire, you are unmuted and please ask your question. Question is seeing uh, all the rivers and uh, mountains as a uh, feature of the world. Uh, could you imagine? citizens organizing in, say, to work together to, uh, for ecology? I didn't get all that, but I, I think um, what I heard you say is uh, citizens would work together uh, for ecology and the planet. And you know, our mission was one planet, one people, one plane. And we think that people, you know, humanity is connected as one with the planet. That's the critical connection. So it is our hope that, um, you know, people can, can work towards that common goal. We use biofuels for the first time in the history of the planet over the North and South Poles. And uh, very proud, you know, to conduct that experiment. Certainly we would have prepared using electric propulsion, but that technology is just not available yet. But uh, we wanted to showcase the best that's available uh, to humanity now. Claire, you had, it looked like you had another question about uh, can Fuel leaks be prevented by double casing? Uh, the better question, not that your question isn't good, but the more precise question would be, could fuel leaks be prevented, Robert, if you didn't misalign the fuel valves uh, on the tanks? <laughs> and I had uh, a brilliant guy named Fred Sorensen who designed that system. Uh, there were 20 valves connecting 10 fuel tanks. And uh, in a moment of high stress, I forgot to open the vent on um, the ferry tanks. So as we pulled fuel from the tanks, rather than pulling air in to replace the fuel, the tanks uh, imploded. And they were connected by a vent line, not to the outside air, but to each other. So the first tank and the second tank uh, weakened, and eventually they would fail on the ground. 
The first fuel leak was due to um, improper uh, cap that had different threads, and that uh, actually leaked in the air, 75 gallons. The remaining two leaks probably um, a total of about another 75. But no, that was total pilot error. And uh, I was told to bring somebody else along just to handle the fueling issues. But to me, you know, the weight of another person is worth more to me in fuel than it is as another mind. And I didn't make that mistake twice, I can promise you that. Mm. Okay, um, Jerry, gentlemen, he's next. He has a question. Jerry, go ahead. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, Robert, I wanted to ask you, this is sounds like quite an undertaking and it sounds like you raised a lot of money in order to do this and coordinated with a lot of people in order to make this happen and coordinate your trip. I wonder if you have any, uh, you know, tips to share with us about how you did all that, how do you coordinated it and brought in sponsors and uh, kind of sold this to people and got people to help you, if you have any tips for other organizations like ours. Thank you. Yeah, I could, you know, quite honestly, Jerry, I could write a book on that and I've been encouraged to uh, do something when all this is finished. I can give you some, some tips though. Uh, 95 sponsors in total, and it took uh, at least two years to bring those people on board. And that was not something I could hand off to somebody else. I made those calls. Uh, meeting people in person, uh, not unlike our mission, was the critical um, component of that. Because when they can see you, when they can see how excited you are, your passion, uh, they can see you know, that you're well-spoken, person. Um, this flight suit actually helped quite a bit because it was kind of like we could bring the mission to them, whereas maybe they couldn't see the plane, how impressive it was and what it was capable of. Um, persistence. I mean, I made so many calls. I was rejected so many times. Um, you know, you've got you to gotta just keep grinding away. Persistence is key. And then having a mission where everybody wins I think is important. You can't go in and say, you know, hey, this is what I want. Uh, rather, we went in and said, hey, this is good for the planet. This is good for aviation. This is good for science. This is good for the people. And uh, we'd like you to be involved. And we want to show you that your products, for example, uh, have been taken to the most extreme points on the planet, tested to the most in the most extreme conditions humanly possible, and worked flawlessly. My engines, the Honeywell TPE 331-10Ts, I mean, I had all kinds of avionics failing over the North and South Poles, and those engines and propellers just kept going, no matter what. It, you know, it's impressive. So um, I think getting people, you know, excited about your mission is critical, and nobody will, you know, describe the mission or the excitement better than the, the person who's most involved. Now, I had an uh, amazing, amazing uh, team and board supporting me, and some of the sponsorship did come in through you know, referrals, but uh, no substitute for going to conventions, meeting people in person, shaking hands, uh, bumping elbows now, I guess, uh, and uh, doing as much for them as uh, maybe more for them than uh, even you're asking for is a good start. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I think that's a good policy in general because um, people are more engaged if they know that, that that's going to help their desires for the world. In other words, um, you know, because we all, we all should and we all pretty much do have um, things that we want to get done while we're here. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Arthur for his questions. Arthur? Can I say one last thing? Um, you know, the most, uh, the best support that I got was from people that I liked and I think they liked me too. So I developed friendships with these people, again, that human connection. And from that, uh, we had amazing things develop, you know, just a simple sponsor ended up uh, using his squadron of Manching aircraft to welcome us back to San Diego with, you know, formation flights around the citizen of the world with smoke trailing. It was fantastic. We got some amazing footage because of that. And, you know, the guy that runs um, one of the, the sponsor that I'm uh, referring to is a good buddy of mine. I love the guy, you know, he's great. I also want to compliment you, not just on your cra being courageous, but this aura, you're, you know, you're, you're the Zen pilot and your 
aura is fantastic. It's so relaxing. It's so beautiful. And I know you were in business before, and that's a different way of being. And I just love that aura that you present when you're around. You know, I can feel it now, you know, through Zoom, but it's even better in person. So that's, and that's great. Well, thank you. You know, we think that the Zen Pilot um, branding has evolved into Peace Pilot. And that's the name, of course, of the docuseries Peace Pilot to the Ends of the Earth and Beyond, possibly the book. But, um, you know, I'm just feeding off of, of you guys as well, Melanie. You know, it's, uh, it doesn't just all come from me. It it's, gets bounced around and amplified. And, you know, I have a, a group of very supportive, positive people around me. That's what it takes, really. Oh. Well, it's beautiful and I love it. Um, okay, so now, Arthur, back to you. Not around and it multiplies. I love that. Now, here, uh, you know, Jerry Tettleman, who just asked a question, he was one of the early funders uh, with his Citizens for Global Solutions in San Diego of the first documentary about Gary Davis that we did. And he uh, is right there in San Diego where they have these, 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 these incredible uh, flybys for Citizen of the World. And I'm not sure if, uh, if, if Jerry uh, uh, knew about those. I, knew, I know he knew that we had that World Citizen Day, but he may have not known there was that spectacle uh, going on. Uh, maybe there are some ways that we could begin to re continue to build that with people here. We have Jerry, we have people with Rotary. Uh, how can people here interact with you to, to bring to life this flight and carry on this mission uh, into the future? Well, I guess just uh, starting communication is the first step in it all, right? So either reaching out to me on the website or the social media, we can start a conversation. I'm always happy to show off the plane. Uh, right now I'm in Texas uh, getting ready to pick it up in a few days to take it to Florida for some new uh, heads up displays and eventually it goes to Santa Maria for a new paint job and then it goes on the road. But, um, you know, if, if you're inspired by some of the things we're talking about, uh, put your hands on a plane that's uh, been charged with the energy of the planet flying over the, you know, South and North poles, uh, that'll make your hair stand up. Trust me. It's a uh, very impressive, um, you know, I, I like to talk about, you know, flying on angel wings because I can tell you 10 different reasons why I shouldn't be alive, but here I am. So that plane's been buoyed up by so much positive energy. Uh, we're very excited to, to get it out there and let people, you know, get in it, touch it, you know, experience the energy and see what the potential is. Um, I also uh, was very touched by one of the things you said about uh, when you mentioned that it was an incredibly powerful Honeywell engine, uh, I know that Honeywell at one point was making those cluster bombs in Vietnam that are still, are still blowing up people's legs and hands. And there was a big Honeywell project to help get them to shift to uh, more civilian production. Uh, and my question comes down, and, and maybe there's uh, one of our, maybe one of our volunteers here on the line would like to comment as well, Tom. Uh, Tom, you know, worked with McDonnell Douglas and some of these same corporations that are making guns and bombs and weapons and even nuclear weapons that could destroy our world are also engines of making something so incredibly powerful as an engine that could take you over to the South Pole and never fail. Um, how, how can we begin to move toward uh, giving those companies who have that incredible technological proneness in the aerospace industry, get them to move uh, in the direction of, of making the, the positive things that help affirm life rather than end life on the planet. You know, I'd like to refer to the engines, the Honeywell TPE331-10Ts as engines of change. And they basically connect people together because you take off from one place and you go to another. And I think Honeywell, the engines division is the one that I, I deal with. Um, has a large or a strong desire for corporate responsibility. And what I, you know, when I was talking with them, I've done podcasts, we've done blogs. Um, you know, we're, we're connecting in a number of ways to get this message out that they're really involved and having impact on the world. I, I'm inspired by corporations that uh, take a stance and want to bring about change. And, you know, we certainly can't change the past. But the present and the future are wide open. So, 
Um, I hope to be a part of that with them. And, um, you know, we're having conversations about, um, you know, these are more than just collections of pieces of metal and, you know, rubber and all the different components. They're, um, they have the potential to change the world, really. You know, they're powering uh, the citizen of the world, which is uh, the vehicle for this powerful message. So, you know, we'll work together and we'll see where that takes us. Uh, Tom, you worked with uh, McDonnell Douglas. Uh, do you have a, a quick comment to share about how these companies can uh, serve the planet? Well, yeah, it's interesting that the engines are made by Honeywell. My stepfather worked for Honeywell uh, from the late 40s into the 60s and had several patents for what is now known today as modern day flight control. Uh, he was a genius. He had over 20 patents with Honeywell. Uh, no, yeah, you know, I worked most of my career in the military industrial complex in uh, Douglas and Boeing and General Dynamics and Martin Marietta. They were all customers of mine. And my thought, it may not pertain to uh, the podcast today, but my thought is uh, how can we as a society steer others away from working for the military industrial complex, like maybe training them to become uh, barbers, electricians, you know, whatever their field of training is. And then in addition to that, how can we convince people to start selling off all their stock in the military industrial complex? So that's, that's just my thoughts. And I, I posted a new website, swordsintheplowshares.net, that I'm hoping to uh, build up. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah. Robert, any comments on, on that? How do we turn swords into plowshares? You know, uh, I think by taking these amazing machines that they're creating and using them for positive purposes is one way to do it. And I think we certainly did that on the trip. Um, these engines are good for the planet because the nearest competition uses twice the fuel. So if everybody was using these TP331-10Ts, there'd be half the carbon in you know, the, the atmosphere right now. And I'm not saying that, that that's the end game. The end game is, at least the next step is electric propulsion. I think a lot of the industry is pretty clear on that. And I know that Honeywell is working towards that end. So. You know, you take what you have in the moment, you do the best you can, and you move forward. Uh, you share your mission and your passion. And that's, you know, what I think I have control over right now. Um, Jane, uh, I see that Jane has a question here in the chat box. Uh, Jane, do you want to unmute and ask it, or should I just uh, read your question for you? Um, well, it's a comment. It's building on what we were discussing a few minutes ago about the engines and being made by Honeywell. And I just said that space exploration can also be part of this because many of the companies that make things like missiles also already make rockets and equipment for space. And I can just imagine you know, if we get to a point where we don't need the missiles and we can put some of that money into the cool space stuff. It's the same companies that make a lot of those things. You know, that's a great point uh, that Jane makes. And our NASA wafer scale experiment was the future or is the future of space exploration. The thought behind it is you don't need to send a rocket motor that's very heavy and thousands of gallons of jet fuel into the atmosphere, you can blast the core components of that rocket, which don't include astronauts. Uh, it literally is a, a um, you know, components, electronic components, a, a circuit board. You can blast them out into space at the rate of one every 15 minutes using electromagnetic cannons that are Earth-based. And you can accomplish many of the same things that some of these rockets have over the years. So the technology evolves. And I think in that case, it's a very positive direction. Wow, I never heard of that. That sounds, sounds terrific. Um, 
yeah, it seems you're you're absolutely right. There is, you know, we we as humans are incredibly inventive species, and it seems to me that what's distorting it, it seems to me these companies want to and would much prefer to make space travel, powerful engines that work. The engineers want to put their minds to that, and what's distorting that is that the money has all gone into the military industrial complex. So if you want funding for what you're doing, you have to make it for war. They don't want to make it for war, but that's where the money is. Uh, and that comes back to we the people. Uh, we're the ones who are setting up those systems that are causing divisions and making us pour trillions of dollars into fighting each other instead of coming together as a planet. Uh, how can we begin to change system systemically that distortion that is keeping us from recognizing our true, true potential as human beings. I think it falls away, you know, when we choose faith over fear, because, you know, if we, as the people of the planet are interacting um, in peaceful ways, supporting each other, cooperating, then the need for these other things goes away. And then who would put money into something that has no future, right? So I think it's, it's really up to us as, you know, the people on the planet to, to drive this. And one good way to start it is to start to get along with other humans and seeing, you know, the common uh, values that we have and the things that are uniquely um, desired by all people. Well, let me turn it uh, back over to Melanie because I believe we have some other questions in the chat box, but I'll let Melanie coordinate the questioners. Well, we just had a comment from um, Joseph about education. Joseph, did you want to say that live or do you, would you like me to go ahead and read it? Um, our history books are divided into various wars. Uh, we learn about the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the First and Second World Wars. We teach children that the only way to resolve issues is through war and see history through such a violent lens. Uh, we have to divide our history books into other things. I don't know. Um, when the polio vaccine was invented, when Gary Davis um, um, discussed world government or whatever. Um, so we socialize kids into this and um, we have to unsocialize them and start talking about world citizenship um, at, an early, at an early age. I just have to say to Robert also, when you talk, you remind me so much of Antoine Saint-Exupéry, whom you probably know, the author of The Little Prince. He was an internationalist and also an aviator. And I cannot help but think of him. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say. Well, thank you for the nice compliment. I have uh, read that book and uh, it's certainly having impact on the, you know, the planet even today. I know Gary Davis also flew in World War II. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe we make, uh, we have our experiences and then we choose a better way forward. And certainly Gary did, he had great impact on the world. And, um, you know, our goal, we're a not-for-profit, the De Laurentiis Foundation, and our goal is to have impact on the world. It's not to make money. You know, we have products so that we can make money to get our message out there. But, um, you know, where you finish is definitely different than where you start. Well, you know, that, uh, that's a very good point. Uh, Gary was not only a, uh, a bomber pilot in World War II. He loved to fly. I mean, right through when he was 85 and, uh, and getting close to 90, he was flying his plane that was called uh, he called it uh, World Government One, uh, I believe it was, and uh, you take off on the presidential plane. And he flew it around the world, uh, rescuing people in need. In fact, the, the last flight took place when he flew to Canada to rescue a, a Native American woman. She was trying to come into, she, she had a, a, a program, uh, a, a shelter in New York City, and she had a New York City driver's license, and, uh, uh, and she went to Canada uh, to buy Bibles to bring back for her shelter. And when she got to the border, they said that, uh, well, you don't look like an American. Uh, are you an American citizen? And she said, well, you know, I live in New York and so on. Well, it turned out she didn't have a birth certificate because uh, her mother had been a, a, a rape victim and they had hushed up in, the, in their small community the, uh, uh, the parent to parentage. Anyway, she couldn't prove she was an American citizen and she got thrown in, in jail in, in Canada. 
And uh, so Gary went to rescue her, was able to get her released, and flew her into the Burlington Airport uh, with her world passport, at which point they not only arrested her, but seized Gary's plane. And he took his court case on himself, but they eventually uh, decided to confiscate and chop up his plane. And that was the end of, 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 of his uh, flying days. But he loved to fly, and that was one of the key things that inspired him on his world citizenship mission. I mean, why am I bombing and killing these people on the wrong side of an invisible line that I can't even see? It doesn't exist. I'd, I'd like to add that Carl Jung, the psychologist, has a word for people like you. He calls you eternal boys, the puer eternus. Um, it's an archetype of people that have passion for what they're doing and, and full of life. I appreciate that, Joseph. I've heard crazy more than that, but I think I'll, <laughs> I'll use that archetype instead. Yeah. Eternal boy. Yeah. I got that problem too, but I don't, I fly all over the world, but I don't have my own plane. Okay. Thanks. Speaking of eternal boy, I certainly love that uh, concept. Tell us more about, how we can get that book for children you mentioned and get it to our, our, our children, our grandchildren. Uh, tell us how we can get more of your wonderful resources. Tell us more about how all of us can engage with you and help you carry on this mission. Thanks, Arthur. Um, the Little Plane That Could, as well as my other books, uh, Zen Pilot, Flight of Passion, The Journey Within, and Flying Through Life are all available on Amazon. And, um, you know, The Little Plane That Could, um, is directed at kids because we think that they get inspired to fly at around the age of three to five. And a lot of the aviation companies are focused on high school kids because they'll be pilots soon. But you know, our foundation is not for profit and the goal is to inspire. So we're hoping to start early and I've gotten some tremendous feedback. I co-wrote that book with one of my mentors, Susan Gilbert, who's a very talented uh, writer and has uh, gotten me to this point in my life. So we're very proud of that. Um, everything starts, if you're looking for us at the website, um, the one I like to give out most recently is called www.pole, so P-O-L-E-2, T-O, pole again, flight.com. So pole to pole flight.com. And from there, you can get to our social media. You can contact me you can order products through the DeLorenis Foundation. You can read some of the blogs um, that basically are what I've learned on the trip, uh, the actual, you know, precise lessons that we call uh, peace lessons or peace moments. So, yeah, reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Wow. <laughs> well, that is great. Well, you know, we are just so, so grateful to you for being on our show and for your courage and for sharing this incredible story. And we, we hope to uh, uh, get the replay uh, to promote it widely. Hopefully you can share it with your uh, constituency. And we want to uh, put, begin to put together an, inter an interactive club where we're all joined together to carry out the kind of thing you're saying. So we'd like to invite you and others to enjoy us next week where we're having, uh, instead of a speaker, we're having a chance to socialize. We, uh, we would love just to have each person talk a little bit, little bit more about yourselves, uh, uh, what you're doing, how this interacts, and begin to see what kind of dynamic begins to build up as we come together as a club to promote being citizens of the world. Um, and we also, uh, we'll invite you out. Let me turn it back to, to Melanie a minute. I think she wants to give you a further invitation before we come back to Robert for his uh, closing comments. Uh, Melanie? Right. Just to love to have you socialize with us, get to know, because, you know, when we do our podcast, we don't get time to talk to everybody. So this way, and we can even do breakout rooms and have questions and chat about a certain subject we like. So it's just a nice social thing. Um, also, welcome to, at this moment in time, you can see the movie free on our website, theworldismycountry.com. So you can go there right now. It's uh, available during the crisis right now, uh, if you haven't done that. So, but please join our club. And if you haven't already, and uh, I think I think that's it. Was there anything else I was going to say? I think that's it. And then back to Robert and Arthur first, and then Robert to, for his comments. Uh, and Melanie, you might also add, if you could, either to the chat or in person. There, there are two uh, wonderful films that are being uh, 
uh, put out there right now that people can join in on. There's uh, Kiss the Earth, and there's uh, one. one uh, is it called One of Many? Is that what's called? Uh, we, we are. are we, we are many. The last uh, oh. day to watch it. So we are many. Yeah, uh, both incredible film opportunity for people to join and taking a look at. Uh, oh, and yeah. also get on Robert's uh, email list so you'll know when his uh, documentary series comes out. So you want to you want to get get in the email his email list for that. So tell us, Robert, how do we get on your email list? Uh, and I, I don't you know if you want to give people an email or whatever to contact you, but. Uh, however, uh, we can carry on. Uh, please continue with that and any uh, last words before we close the show. Sure, you can reach out to me on the website, the pole -pole flight .com. You know, I was uh, watching uh, or listening to Melanie talk and behind her there's that poster that says one exclamation mark, the Gary Davis story. Mm -hmm. Our mission is one planet, one people, one plane. And I think a lot of us are saying the same thing. You know, we're tired of being divided uh, we want to connect. And, you know, that's the human way. That's the way we were put on this planet. And now we just have to take a step maybe every day and, and try and make that happen. Not try, but make it happen. So I would encourage everybody to move forward together. Um, you know, my trip was exciting in many ways, challenging, scary, risky, all these things. But the intention was to bring it in this mission of oneness into focus for everybody. It's kind of like the, um, the solar eclipse, you know, everybody's focused on that one event. And that's part of what our mission was about. Hey, this is what we're promoting. Let's all focus on this and move ahead as humans. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, you can go to onefilms.com, onefilms.com and see our, uh, our, our one, one story. Uh, and which actually consists of three parts and you'll continue with our club to hear more from Robert. So thank you everyone for joining us in the People Powered Planet podcast. See you next Wednesday, same time, same place. World citizen, lift up your voices. Oh, you know we got something to say. All we need is the same directions, heading in one way. One way.